Good afternoon, everyone. And my name is Eileen Breslin. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health at UT Health Science Center. And today I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to Dr. Galea, a physician, epidemiologist, author, and Dean, and currently holds the Robert A. Knox Professorship at the Boston University School of Public Health. He has held previous academic appointments and leadership positions at Columbia University, the University of Michigan, and the New York Academy of Medicine. He has published extensively over 900 articles and 18 books, and he's a regular contributor to a wide range of public media about the social causes of health, mental health, and the consequences of trauma. He is listed as one of the most widely cited scholars in the social sciences, and we are so privileged to have him here with us today. He has been the past chair of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health and the past president of the Society for Epidemiological Research and the Interdisciplinary Association for Population Health Science. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. He's received several lifetime achievement awards and he holds a medical degree from the University of Toronto and graduate degrees in public health from Harvard University and Columbia University and an honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow. Today, his talk is entitled Priorities for Health in the Post-COVID-19 Era, which is based upon his new book, The Contagion Next Time. This book really challenges us to tackle the deep-rooted problems preventing us from being a vibrant nation and a very healthy world. I think he'll lay out um, the foundational flaws within our healthcare delivery system that have been exasperated and brought to light by COVID-19 and really will help us analyze systemic issues that are preventing us from being the best that we can be. And I think that will give us some solutions for pandemic resiliency. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Galea, I welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dean Breslin. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a privilege to be here. I only wish I were with you in Texas, um, where I think the weather is probably warmer than it is here. And I look forward to a time when we can actually do this, such things in person again. Uh, let me share my screen. So as Dean Breslin mentioned, I want to talk about uh, priorities for health. And I want to talk about priorities for health through the COVID lens. Although, as you'll see from my talk, a substantial part of my talk actually is not directly linked to COVID, but uh, it, uh, I want to make the case for why, what, our health, what in our health matters, and how we have come to understand it in a COVID world. I'll start with something that's perhaps counterintuitive, but I hope you'll bear with me. I want to start with the notion that a lot went right during COVID-19. Now, I, um, I realize that we're in the middle of COVID still, and we know that COVID has been an utter tragedy with more than 700,000 American lives uh, lost and millions more around the world. So it's hard to think of, um, of things going right, but I do think it's important to recognize what did go right for various reasons. Number one is because I think recognizing what went right means that uh, we are able to have a clearer focus on what we need to improve. And number two is we can learn from what went right and understand why some things went right while other things did not. Now, so what did go right? Well, first of all, I'll start here. This is a um, uh, looks at uh, COVID admissions, which is the gray bar. But the, the, what I want you to look at is the blue lines, the adjusted and unadjusted mortality. And that looks at um, mortality in the first few months after March of 2020. And what you see is that mortality from COVID, which started being at 25%, drops dramatically over the course of three months to 5% and then less than that. So we dropped mortality from a totally unknown disease, a disease we had never encountered before, never heard of in, uh, in three months, fivefold. That, if you think about it, is amazing. And we did that through our hospital system, through our healthcare system, through improved clinical experience, through better use of pharmacological treatments, things like remdesivir and steroids, through better known pharmacological treatments, things like proning. All of that really, to my mind, was a triumph of our healthcare system, adapting to a previously unknown pathogen. Of course, what went most right most right in the context of COVID is this, the vaccines. That um, we developed vaccines within eight months, ready to go to, um, to market from uh, when the disease um, uh, was first diagnosed, that were more than 90% efficacious. Hard to remember now, but in the summer of 2020, we're having conversations, well, what if we have vaccines that are 50% effective? Then what do we do? Instead of good vaccines that were 90, 95% effective, 
in record time. I mean, usually vaccines take 10 plus years to develop. The fastest vaccine we had ever developed before was mumps, which has taken us three months. But this really was about eight months. And um, that is extraordinary. Now, of course, it wasn't just eight months, right? And this is where we get to understanding why it is that we, we achieve what we achieve, because it wasn't just eight months. What it actually was, was a decade of investment. This is from paper from uh, almost a decade ago about developing mRNA vaccine technology. And I like this quote from it, which says, mRNA presents a promising vector that may well become the basis of a game-changing vaccine technology platform. I just think it's a fantastic quote because of course, it's exactly what happened. And it happened because we had spent 10 years investing in this technology. And that I think is um, part of the message which I wanna give is that things that we invest in, we actually do quite well in. It's things that we don't invest in that we don't do well. And part of the theme of the stock, and as like Dean Breslin mentioned, is the theme of my book, is what it is that we should invest in to make sure that we do as well as can be in a pandemic and in a future pandemic. Now, so much went wrong. The world, the world has been really on fire with COVID. There's a map of the world and the map of COVID. This looks at the um, waves. The world's, world's been sort of through three. These are global waves of COVID, three major waves of COVID. We're in the process of vaccinating the world with enormous vaccine inequities, looking at continents like Africa, where vaccination remains at the 2 to 5% range. And focusing on the US, this is a map of uh, the US in 2020, uh, looking at density of COVID. That um, This is from the New York Times, and they colored in density of COVID, which red and uh, the, um, I would argue if you were an alien coming into the planet, not knowing what this was about, you would know it's about nothing good because it really looked like the whole country was on fire. We've been through multiple waves of COVID. We're now finishing the Delta wave and hopefully this is the last wave, but it's hard to know whether it is the last wave or not. And of course, deaths have not just been due to COVID. We've had excess mortality from all sorts of, the, of, um, of uh, diseases. If this is a uh, mortality in the previous years. This is the black line is the average. And what you see here is as of March of 2020, you have this shooting up of excess mortality um, in the US with deaths from all causes, which is which includes and in, um, much more than just COVID. Perhaps most dramatically, we recognize that COVID was the third leading cause of death in the United States in 2020. Now, if I were to say to you today that in 2024, there is going to be a... Um, a new disease, you've never heard of it. Right? You actually, you don't know what it's called. And it's going to become the third leading cause of death, just like that. Comes from nowhere, becomes third leading cause of death. I think you would be a bit alarmed by that. I think you would say, wow, well, what should we do about that? Can, how can we prevent that? And that's what COVID became for us. And I think we are in a position now, learning from COVID to ask, how do we prevent that? Because COVID has had a dramatic impact, including, for example, on our life expectancy. We've had this... Tremendous drop in life expectancy, largest drop in life expectancy we've had as a country since World War II, actually. And perhaps just moving beyond the numbers just for a second, COVID has been people, you know, 700,000 Americans. These are people's friends, spouses, daughters, sons, grandparents, lovers who have died in the time of COVID. And that, to my mind, is the ultimate tragedy of what happened in COVID. And the people who died have not died evenly. It has not been proportional death in the context of COVID. This is uh, looks at black versus white mortality, just focusing on those two racial groups. The red, red bars are adjusted, so we can just focus on the red bars. And what you see is that um, black mortality is about twofold higher than was white mortality. And in fact, when we look back at life expectancy, life expectancy was not experienced evenly across all racial groups. Among white women, which is on the right of this graph, uh, there was a 0.7 loss years loss of life expectancy in 2020. Among black men on the left, there was a three year loss in life expectancy. Now, 0.7 year loss in life expectancy is already dramatic. We had not had uh, that uh, size drop in life expectancy, as I said, since World War II. A three year drop in life expectancy is extraordinary. And this is among black men, which in, in large, gender ethno-racial groupings actually is the group which already has the lowest life expectancy. So these differences, this is a threefold difference in life expectancy is really remarkable and remarkable in a, in, in a very sad way. And I think it reflects some of these underlying processes and these underlying 
inequities that COVID exposes. I'm going to come back to the black-white difference in a second to use it as an illustration of what really happened during COVID. Now, during COVID, although I've talked about health and I've talked about death and I've talked about um, some of these racial differences in death, and um, we should not forget that it wasn't just death from COVID and death from other diseases. It was also an enormous social and economic upheaval. This looks at employment and shows that uh, employment level dropped to its lowest level since 1975 in the time of COVID. And there were a lot of jobs lost. And in particular, there were jobs lost in among low wage workers. This looks at the red line is high wage workers, the blue line is low wage workers. And what you see is although there was job loss at all wages, essentially by June of 2020, jobs had recovered among high wage workers. And in fact, jobs are, are now higher than they were pre-COVID among high wage workers. Among low wage workers, jobs remain about 20% lower. Looking at this another way, this shows the um, employment by income quarter. And what you see is actually in the higher income quarter on the right, it, there was a net increase of jobs in time of COVID. It's in the lower income half, which is the third and fourth income quarter, that there's been a decrease in jobs. We have lost jobs in uh, essentially in uh, um, manual labor and retail um, um, in the, and really in occupations that are essential to the functioning of our society, often low wage, often low paid, and disproportionately represented by people of color in these jobs. Just to make the point a little bit more clearly, this looks, this is at the Congressional Research Service, this is black and white, black, Asian, white jobs, but just focusing on black and white at the either end of um, this graph. This looks at what the unemployment was before COVID recession at the peak of COVID recession and then current, current was a few months ago. Now what you see is among black Americans, it was 6.1, went up to 16, went down to 9.7. Among white Americans, it was three, went up to 14 and went down to five. You can look at it as Latino versus non-Latino. It was sort of five, 18 to seven and, and, and non-Latinos three, 13 to five. And you can also look at this stratified by different things. For example, education. On the top left quadrant, you have people with less than a high school education. In the bottom right quadrant, you have people with a bachelor's degree or higher. So in the top left quadrant, you have the um, uh, pre-recession was 5%, went up to 20%, and now came down to nine. That's less than high school diploma. Well, with bachelor's degree or higher, the current is about three, which is threefold less than it is if you don't have a high school diploma. Because the fundamental characteristic, the fundamental um, defining feature of this COVID recession and really of the COVID moment in general has been one of inequity. This has been a story of inequity and a story of an unequally experienced pandemic and equally well an unequally experienced uh, recession. And it did not have to be like this. And in fact, it was not like this in many other, con in many other recessions. If you look at, um, 1990, 2001, 2008 recessions, and then the coronavirus recession. Uh, this, um, what you're seeing here, the green line are the highest earning 25% of population. The purple line is the lowest earning 25% of population. And what you see is in the 1990, 2001, 2008 recessions, those two lines didn't diverge that much. In the coronavirus recession, they diverged enormously. The lowest earning uh, quartile uh, dropped jobs and, and y-axis is job loss. Um, dramatically compared to the highest earning 25%. This pattern of inequity on all dimensions, both in terms of the experience of COVID, as well as um, in the experience of the consequences of meaning the economic experiences, resulted, perhaps not unexpectedly, in then the largest civil unrest that the country has ever seen. The civil unrest of 2020 had about 20 million people who, were, um, who took to the streets in protest, which was the largest the country's ever seen, larger even than 1968. Now, the civil unrest was um, sparked by the killing of unarmed black men and women, George Floyd centrally and many others. But it wasn't just that, of course. It was also the realization of these deep inequities, many of which, in fact, almost all of which, had been around for decades, if not centuries. And recognizing that when something like COVID hits us, it exposes these inequities, exposes these fractures, and exposes how we as a society have not tended to these inequities the way we should. So having painted the picture of what happened in COVID, I want to talk about why, why did it all go so wrong? 
And I'm going to use the example of the black-white differences in mortality to explain um, what, what happened. And I, I could use many different other examples. Obviously, although I'm talking about black-white differences, I do want to acknowledge, for example, that uh, the death rate among Indigenous Americans was also substantially higher than it was among white Americans. But I, I want to just focus on black-white difference just for, for ease of comparison. And also because I think understanding the black-white difference reveals the forces that actually went wrong. So remember, I'm starting with the premise, with the data observation, that Black Americans had about a twofold higher mortality than did white Americans during COVID. Now, why did that happen? Well, that happened for two reasons. And again, I'm using these reasons as illustrative, but I think they illustrate the fundamental problem with COVID to begin with. They happened for two reasons. Number one was there was an unnecessary risk of getting COVID. Now, remember, COVID is a respiratory disease transmitted to respiratory droplets from one person to another. So the risk of getting COVID is, comes from people being exposed to one another. So how could that be different? How is that different? And how does that translate into differential risk of getting COVID? Well, it translates to differential risk of getting COVID because different people had different capacity to protect themselves from being around other people. So this is the... Um, share of the population staying at home by income group. The gray line is the wealthiest 20%. The red line is the poorest 20%. And what you see is the yellow dot is March 2020, when the country has a national emergency, emergency declared. And what you see is that the wealthiest 20% <clears throat> immediately started staying at home more, protecting themselves from other people. And as a result, of course, being less at risk of getting COVID, while the poorest 20% we're less able to stay at home. Another way of looking at this is by looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, data by income quarter. If income quarter on the x-axis, going from the bottom 25% of income to the top 25% of income, and on the y-axis, you have the ability to work remotely. Now, what you see is the higher your income quartile, the more likely you are to be able to work remotely. It's a very classic, what's called in epidemiology, a dose response relationship which means that people in the higher income brackets who remember were also the group that were most protected from, um, 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 uh, from unemployment was the group that was able to work remotely and as a result, less likely to get COVID. And these patterns are also racially patterned. This looks at um, black Americans versus other racial groups showing that black Americans are more likely to be employed in essential industries. So the first answer to why did it go wrong is because there was differential risk of getting COVID for particular groups. The second question is, the second answer is, there was, an, uh, there was a differential risk of severe COVID. It's not just about getting COVID, it's actually about having severe COVID and as a result, dying from COVID. Now, what created the risk of severe COVID? Well, we've known this right from the beginning. This is data from the China CDC in February of 2020, early on in the pandemic. Death rate for COVID-19 patients in China is higher among those with underlying conditions, which has been consistently the case throughout COVID. In fact, one of the things that's been least well understood in COVID is that death rate for people without underlying conditions is actually quite, quite low. Um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, respiratory disease, that is what confers risk of severe COVID. Well, who has underlying conditions? Well, this graph shows that. Income on the, on the x-axis, and this is likelihood on the y-axis, the yellow bar is having illness that makes you vulnerable to COVID. Well, the more income you have, the less the yellow bar. More income you have, the less likely you are to have an illness that makes you vulnerable to COVID. The green bar, by the way, is having long-standing mental health condition that makes you vulnerable then to mental health problems after COVID. Essentially, the higher the income you have, remember, in the first explanation was you are you have lower risk of being exposed to COVID. But in the second explanation, you have lower risk of severe COVID the higher income you have. And once again, the income is also has social, uh, has racial patterning. This looks at mortality, black American versus white American mortality is pre-COVID. Black is blue and white is red. And you see black Americans had a higher death rate at the young, middle, older, older ages. But uh, you look at risk factors, things like high blood pressure and diabetes. Again, black Americans, higher, de death, uh, higher uh, prevalence of high blood pressure, diabetes, younger ages, middle ages, older ages. And of course, this black-white differential in morbidity goes back decades, if not centuries, well, actually centuries. It goes back to the disenfranchisement of, um, 
Black Americans from American life, which of course with uh, reaching its pinnacle in the institution of slavery, which uh, disenfranchised Black Americans um, uh, for centuries, for about 400 years. This is a um, map of slavery in the United States in, 18, in uh, 1860, with the, with the darker color showing where there were more African Americans who were enslaved. And of course, slavery was then accompanied by uh, Jim Crow laws and many other efforts to structurally disadvantage uh, Black Americans including, for example, the practice of redlining. So the redlining, which emerged from the federal government effort to create opportunities for Americans to buy houses, to accumulate wealth, was translated through the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which, whose job it was to help facilitate banks lending um, uh, to uh, Americans to buy homes. But of course, part of what they were doing to do that was they were marking. They were marking neighborhoods by areas that were desirable or not desirable for um, home buying. And the green areas here that were marked as a map of Detroit um, were considered desirable. The red areas were considered not desirable for loan for lending money. And of course, the red areas were areas where African Americans lived in Detroit. That led to the practice of redlining, what we what we now call redlining, and of course that led to substantial disadvantage for Black Americans in accumulating wealth that could create, protect them from uh, harmful health and has created some of these deeply entrenched Black white differences in health that we see to this day that in the context of COVID resulted in differential mortality from COVID. So recognizing then that, that what went wrong was both on the axis of getting COVID as well as on the axis of getting severe COVID, I think it's worth asking well, why did we get this wrong? Why did we get this all this wrong? And I would argue that we got it wrong on two dimensions for two reasons. One is underinvestment in what makes us healthy. And the other one is underinvestment in what can keep us healthy. Well, let me start with the first one. Let me start with underinvestment in what makes us healthy. And I will try to explain that by telling a Texas story, actually. This is blind Willie Johnson, who uh, was a blues man. And he was born in Texas at the turn of the 20th century in the 1900s. He um, was born sighted, and uh, the story is that he lost his vision in, uh, at age seven when uh, in a domestic violence incident. So he grew up poor, blind, and black. He made a living busking, playing the guitar, and uh, not a very good living, as, uh, as you can imagine. Him and his wife got married. They were living in a small house, which burned down at one point. They weren't injured, but they had no money. So when the fire finished burning, they went back, and they were living in the burnt down shell of the house. In the 1940s, when he was in his 40s, he uh, developed malaria, which, as you all know, um, was not uncommon in Texas at the time. And he went to hospital. His wife took him to hospital, and he was turned away from hospital. And then he died. So the question with Blind Willie Johnson is, well, what killed Blind Willie Johnson? Obviously, what killed him was malaria. But it wasn't just malaria that killed Blind Willie Johnson, right? It was also poverty racism, domestic violence, poor access to care, homelessness, all of these forces contributed to killing blind Willie Johnson. Now I tell the story, apart from the Texas flavor and for this audience, um, because I think blind Willie Johnson's story represents how we tend to misunderstand health and how we misunderstand health, because we tend to think of health as being all about malaria. So when we think of health as all about malaria, we tend to think of health as being something that we can treat our way out of rather than something which actually we need to build a whole structure to promote it. Now, the Blind Willie Johnson story, I can tell you in an infographic, this is the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement, for example, where you see that healthcare medicine, which is the bottom gray part, is only about 10 to 20% of health and uh, health behaviors, physical environment, socioeconomic factors, smoking, drinking, um, sexual activity, um, where we live, work, play, education, job status, those are the forces that matter more for our health. But although we may understand it, particularly in circles like this, in the rooms like this one, that's not where we spend our money on. The same colorful figure here is the figure on the left here, just in rendered in black and white, because there's a picture from my new book. And uh, then you see medicine is the dark uh, bar, about 20% in the middle. Although medicine, about 10, 20% on the right is what we actually spend our money on. And we spend 90% of our money all on medicine. Then we spend a lot of money. We spend a lot of money in, uh, we spend a lot of money in medicine. 
the uh, this is our um, this is our spending. This is our uh, the blue line is um, our spending in medicine. Um, that's the line that's going up, and the other colorful lines are um, the um, our other countries. And we spend forty percent more than any other country in uh, in our in our health. But of course, we don't spend we don't spend um, on health. What we spend our money on is on healthcare. We spend our money on malaria, um, to use the blind Willie Johnson metaphor. If you look at this, leaving aside social security, our spending on healthcare has been going up while all other spending has actually been going down. And this is the picture of our health. And this is what I mean when I say we're not spending on what makes us healthy. And in fact, we've been doing this long before COVID. Remember, this is nothing to do with COVID and we have been paying the price already long before COVID. This looks at life expectancy in the context of um, the US versus other countries. And I like the slide because it's called ironically American exceptionalism. Um, but what you see is that um, the brown line is the line um, that represents American life expectancy. And we are have life expectancy about five years less than we do for um, um, than do all other high income countries. So five years lower life expectancy than all other high income countries. Perhaps one way of looking at this is life expectancy on the y-axis, income is on the x-axis. And um, we have, as income goes up, life expectancy goes up for all countries, except for the US. As our spending goes up, life expectancy tails off. We like fail to thrive, we fall off the curve. Put another way, I would challenge the audience to think of another sector where we spend more than all other countries and get less. I would argue there is no other sector. I would argue actually if your smartphone, so if I told you that your smartphone um, in Texas were to cost you more, but it would hold less data and it would be slower than uh, smartphones that you can buy in surrounding states, you wouldn't buy a smartphone in Texas, you would go to the surrounding states to buy your smartphone. But somehow withheld, we accept the fact that we're going to spend more and get less, which is not true of any other sector. So reason A, why we got things so wrong is because we, we have underinvested in what causes health. Reason B is underinvestment in what may have helped. Well, what may have helped is an investment in it is an investment in force of public health that could keep us healthy in time of a crisis. Um, but in fact, our state and local health departments have been shrinking. Most states spend less than $100 per person on public health. The darker color here represents uh, less money spent. And even though there have been uh, federal bills like a uh, federal prevention fund, which is the black line, we actually tend to spend, we have spent much less than that because these funds tend to get chipped away. And most state public health agency staffing has been going down as has expenditure per resident. The brown, the brown here is going down. And in fact, most, most counties spend more on policing than they do on health, which ultimately means that we are not spending the money on where it could be spent. So let's talk about COVID now. So what, what's the opportunity in terms of COVID and how does that present an opportunity for us to focus on our priorities for health in a post-COVID world? Now, this is a piece that I actually wrote for US News in 2019, it's before COVID. Um, it's actually exactly a year before COVID, I arguing for a health new deal, focusing on how to improve the health of populations. Um, I, I wish I weren't, but I think I was right then uh, and, and it sort of prefaced what was happening in, in terms of COVID. Americans, here, the good news is the Americans continue to have confidence in doctors and scientists, which means that we are in a position to actually help inflect the conversation going forward. And I argue that what we need to do consistently is to work on two axes, work on the axis of generating knowledge that can inform action and, and creating the values that allow action. We want to be in the top right-hand corner. It is not good enough to say we have efficacious vaccines if people don't want to take vaccines. We need to say we need to develop the efficacious vaccines and make sure that people want to take vaccines. It's not good enough to say that unless we actually have stable housing where people can actually be able to isolate from infectious disease, um, um, people are um, that unless we have that, we're going to be at risk of exposure to an infectious disease. We actually need to make sure we have the values that allow us to build a stable housing, and that's fundamentally what should be informing and guiding. Now, as I start to wind down, because I actually want to make sure that uh, I get time for questions, I want to turn a, a, um, a bit of a lens on ourselves. I want to turn the lens of ourselves and talk about um, how we need to do ever better science, how we need to do ever better science 
in order to generate in order to generate the kind of evidence and to help move us towards the values that can create better health. And I want to talk about three mistakes that I think we've been making in a time of COVID. And I'd be curious in the Q&A afterwards to hear from you how you feel this has played out in your context. And these are the three, false certitude, contradiction without acknowledgement, and intolerance of disagreement. Let me talk about each of them. I think we have approached this moment with substantial false certitude from the point of science, which I think chips away. All of this is because, of, I'm saying this because it chips away at our ability to actually create an agenda for a healthier world. A lot of that has come around our modeling, not us saying about um, the, um, that we know what's going to happen. In fact, we actually had no idea what was going to happen with this infectious disease. And um, the, uh, this is um, from some newspapers um, talking about the failure of influential COVID-19 models. And I'm not saying this to actually pick on any one group or any one set of models. In fact, none of the models were particularly good. But simply to say that we led with our prognostication, even though we knew and should have known that modeling is a very weak effort. It really gives us a very, very weak capacity to actually predict what happens in, an, in a novel outbreak like this. This is from a, a quote from a paper about modeling that says, with a lot at stake, it's wise to be humble when faced with fundamental limitations. Models are usable as long as they take into account uncertainty of assumptions. If that's not the case, results of models are on a par with assumptions or guesses. We have had a hard time in this pandemic being clear about when we're frankly guessing. Even though, Science shows us that actually community public can handle uncertainty. Here's from a paper which says results show birth. People do perceive uncertainty when it's communicated. There's only small decrease in trust and trustworthiness of the source. And in fact, in the long term, it actually might be better for people to understand when we do not know. So number one is false certitude. Number two is contradiction without acknowledgement. One of the biggest things in that has been the issue of masks, where um, initially we sort of said we don't need a mask. And then we, when the science showed otherwise, instead of acknowledging that science changed, we sort of started deleting what we said before and sort of pretending like we never said that masks were not needed to begin with, which then of course resulted in political divisions about the wearing of masks, some of which are happening where you all are. And I, I actually think that some of these divisions are emerge from the, um, from the way science handled our understanding of things like this. Number three is intolerance of disagreement. There is tremendous disagreement across the country in a time like this. And I actually think that we in science and we in public health have not been tolerant of the disagreement. I think the tone that public health has taken has been largely one of disbelief, not being able to believe that people would potentially disagree um, with some of these tenets of science. For example, when a group of scientists put out the Great Barrington Declaration, which uh, essentially argued for a different way of dealing with COVID than was the dominant public health view, it was criticized by, for example, the Union of Concerned Scientists as herding people to slaughter. It's called the dangerous fringe theory. But in fact, when you read this quote, dangerous fringe theory, it said things like adopting measures to protect the vulnerable should be central aim of the COVID-19 response. Nursing homes should use staff with acquired immunity. Staff rotation should be minimized. We need, um, when possible, retired people living at homes um, should meet family members outside rather than inside. All things that are entirely rational and all things that fundamentally we did not leave space for in the public health conversation because we were consumed with a heterodoxy that emerged very quickly. And of course, a lot of this also played out around schools with uh, here's when Philadelphia tries to reopen schools, as Commissioner B said, we should not have to, cheat, teach, uh, to teach students to death, even though we know that children, as I'm gonna show you in a second, have been at very low risk of uh, dying in the context of uh, COVID. So why did we fall short on our promises? So I'll conclude with this. I, I'm gonna, I wanna say why we fall short because I think it's important to understand why we fall short as we aim to do better. Well, why did we fall short? Well, we fall short for three reasons. We're dealing with very complex systems. We have biases and we succumb to groupthink. Going back to schools, going back to uh, learning in schools, um, the country has essentially had a a educational lag, an extraordinary educational lag over the course of the past, um, um, over the course of the past year, the, the orange, or sorry, the pink is, 20, is 19 and the green is 20. And you see the curve shifting to the left. These are math scores. Math scores going down for everybody, but not evenly for everybody. When you look at it by racial group, the darker dot are schools with more than 50% students of color. The lighter dots are schools with more than 50% white students. And you see that schools with, with more students of color fall behind consistently. Not just that, 
schools in more affluent areas reopen faster than those in low income communities. And which means that we have increased educational achievement, educational achievement gaps between the kids who are the haves and the have nots, even though, even though the mortality rate for children in the context of COVID is, is astonishingly low. In fact, it's more dangerous for kids to be driving to school than it is for kids to actually get COVID in school. And even though we know that education is perhaps um, the single biggest protector against poor health, if you look at these are different racial ethnic groups, but just focus on the right, maybe just on white, these bars represent mortality rate. And the more education you have, the lower the mortality rate. It's then no wonder that there have been protests like this one, and they're appropriate protests. They are protests that uh, fundamentally are about, you see here, isolation kills, mental health matters, um, um, that, uh, that really are differences of opinion about how we should be dealing with these complex systems. Number two is our biases. We bring biases to the table and the science does and the political system does and the political system showed itself to be extraordinarily biased in the efforts that we took in the time of COVID. This is the uh, new members of the 116th Congress. And I often ask people, and if we're in person, I would ask you to sort of, uh, you know, to shout this out, but it's hard to do it on Zoom. Um, you know, what's the one axis on which Congress least well represents America? And people say things like gender and race. And actually, you know, we're not perfect either of those, but we're actually not bad. The one area where Congress least well represents America, which is this, is the percent of Americans with a four-year college degree. The yellow is the percent without a four-year college degree. Congress, only 5% of Congress does not have a four-year college degree. 65% of Americans do not have a four-year college degree, which means that when you're in Congress, you're actually making decisions that are utterly divorced from your experience as somebody with a four-year college degree. And as I showed you before, as you saw before, it was um, a lot of the consequences of the approaches we took towards COVID actually differentially disadvantaged those without a four-year college degree. We in the academic world, in particular, bring a very political partisan perspective to this argument. This is um, looks at um, professors, associate assistant professors. All I want to show you is that you see the middle. Well, we're actually all left of middle, essentially, in the academic world, which is a very particular perspective, different than where half the country is, where the country is split fairly evenly, half being left, half being right. And another way of looking at this is how people fared during COVID. This is on mental health, personal finances, job security, take home pay physical health, personal life, work-life balance. Above the line means you did better, below the line you did worse. And what you see, all groups across all dimensions did worse, except one group, which is this group right here, which did better on everything. And that's the group with a postgraduate degree. And the group with postgraduate degree, of course, are those in the academy, which means that we brought our biases to bear on the prescriptions that we gave in the context of COVID. And then, of course, there are also our racial ethnic composition of those in the academy. This looks at epidemiologists who, of course, were front and center in time of COVID. Epidemiologists are um, more than three quarters of epidemiologists are either white or Asian, South Asian, which, of course, is vastly different than this whole population. The second reason, uh, the third reason, I apologize, why we got things wrong is groupthink. We got ourselves into thinking in particular ways. One of those ways was, for example, thinking that we can actually get to zero COVID, even though zero COVID was perhaps in the scientific, um, in the old scientific joke, um, a little bit like a spherical cow problem. This is an old scientific joke, which says, you know, assume a spherical cow of uniform density, which of course doesn't exist. Neither does zero COVID. There's actually no evidence that um, um, uh, there was never any real rational reason to believe that we could achieve zero COVID. We've only eliminated one disease, smallpox. And... Um, that was not respiratory transmission, and it also was not transmitted through other species as well to us. Now, essentially all countries have adopted, abandoned zero COVID, but not until many academic lobby groups emerged, which were an enormous distraction to getting us to where we need to get to. And because I often speak to academic audiences, I try to show academic audiences this slide. Um, this looks at Democrats versus Republicans and shows the, the, the who lives in bubbles. And what you see is Democrats on the left, 38% of Democrats live in, in, in a bubble of people like them, where essentially all their neighbors are Democrats, while about 19% of Republicans live in a bubble. Um, we often don't know other people who think differently than us, and I think that has come to hurt us in a time of COVID. And when I talk to my own community here in Boston, I showed them this slide, which shows that the most intolerant county in America actually is Suffolk County, Massachusetts, which is where my school is. And I use that as a way of reminding us that we actually need to think in a, in a way that respects and listens to the plurality of voices out there. So I want to end with this, that I would argue that we actually need to reclaim, reclaim a, um, 
a liberal public health, which is a public health that's grounded on uh, the values of listening to multiple voices, being aware of the world around us, and that fundamentally advances our cause for a better world. And I think there are three features of this, humility, compassion, and reform through reason. And I'll just talk quickly about each of them. By humility, I mean actually shedding the hubris that has come from things like this. Um, New York Times has um, shown what epidemiologists are doing for Thanksgiving, what epidemiologists are doing for Christmas. That easily goes to your head, makes you feel like as an epidemiologist, which is my discipline. Um, um, like we actually have the answer to everything. Well, we in fact, we've had the answer to very little in the time of COVID. Epistemic arrogance is the tendency to overestimate our ability to predict when we're overconfident in our knowledge. And I think we need to shake that. I think we need to have the humility to realize that we often do not know. And that's a way for us to be, achieve the kind of acceptance that we want so that we can push forward on ideas that push for a rethinking of public health post-COVID. Secondly, is to show radical compassion, compassion for those who are not like us. It's, um, remember, I go back to the slide I showed you earlier that um, the ability to protect yourself from COVID was entirely socioeconomically patterned. You had more money, you're more able to stay, to stay home. You had more money, you're more able to work remotely. And in fact, you had more money, you're less likely to lose a job. So it is actually one, it's all fine and good for those with more money to say, well, just stay away, just stay home, work from home. In fact, the majority of Americans never had the option of working from home. And in fact, staying home results in things like this with 93,000 people dying from opioids, which is just an extraordinary number and about 20,000 more than it had been the previous year. Compassion says we should be careful about what we are prescribing because it affects people, it affects real people. And finally, we want to achieve reform through reason. We want to have a radical vision, a vision of a world where the reasons why COVID was such a disaster do not happen anymore, where we mitigate the reasons for differential risk of getting COVID, differential risk of severity from COVID, where we overturn the centuries of marginalization that have resulted in the conditions that make people so sick and conscious of COVID, but do that in a way that builds and that brings people along. And I think that is what we need to do fundamentally to get to achieve a new public health agenda. And a lot of this is subject of my new book, which um, Dean Breslin kindly pointed out, which actually comes out in November 1. And I will stop there because I would love to hear your questions and comments. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much for this brilliant presentation. And I think I want to, as people start to collect their thoughts and think about questions, and I um, ask you to raise your hand um, and um, we can call on you, is to really think about, as you thinking about this notion of humility, compassion, and reason, what advice would you give to those who are interested in developing new public policy? And particularly as it re relates to the public health departments who really have taken, I, I, you know, they've been at the front line really taking it. And, and I'm just wondering, what would your approach be to how do we help inform new and incremental public policy using this? Yeah, I've come to feel like public policy fundamentally reflects public sentiment. And a large part of our job is to change public sentiment so that the policymakers understand the kind of world, the kind of healthy world that we want. And as a result, I feel like our job in the academy is centrally, centrally to change how we talk about health and to do that through a relentless focus on pushing forward the ideas of what generates health. Because often policymakers don't understand these things. I mean, why should they? I mean, why should somebody whose um, professional life is an accountant who then becomes a policymaker understand that housing matters for health, understand that the characteristics of where you live matter for health? They, they, she has no way of understanding that. And it's our job to change the conversation of health on health. I feel like until such time, until such time as everybody sitting around the proverbial kitchen table in America understands what really causes health, we're not going to have changes in public policy. Which really causes, I think, um, reinventing the curriculum from a disease-focused curriculum to a health-focused curriculum. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And I think that that um, and the latest nursing report from the Institute of Medicine really underscored the role that social determinants of health plays and nurses roles in doing that. And we have really 
are looking at doing that, but I think that the healthcare delivery system, as you have so eloquently pointed out, the reward system is not necessarily where um, housing, education, um, those things are gonna make more of an impact than um, the treatment protocols. So I, I think what I wanna do is see if anyone else has some burning questions, if you just want to ask. I'm not, people are not raising their hands. We'll take that as a sign of clarity, perhaps. <laughs> we, um, we don't have any questions in the chat. Oh, looks like maybe we just got one. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a couple of folks saying thank you for the great presentation. Mm -hmm. What are some of the approaches or mechanisms that may be taken to manage the burnout of health professionals as we transition to a post-COVID era? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I do think that uh, this is a real concern. And I think the, the first part of the of the solution to this is awareness, which I which I, I think we are getting awareness. And thank you for your question. And uh, secondly, it is a recognition that we're in this for the long haul. This is not going to go away. I mean, COVID itself may go away, but I think our challenges, now that we realize them, should not go away. So we have, we're going to have more work to do, not less work to do. So I would encourage everybody to lean into taking the, lean into finding the space to look after themselves and to look after caregivers so that they have the stamina, we have the stamina to keep doing what we're doing. Because the time has never been better for the messages of uh, health. And I actually think that um, it is then critical that we do not lose momentum. Now, there's going to be a lot of work, and I would hate to see us um, not do that work. And to do that, we need to be healthy. It's really true. I'm, I'm curious as to um, how we might tackle some of the education issues that have presented themselves with the children losing math. And, uh, and as we all know, in science in the STEM, you know, that's sort of essential talent. I mean, what things have you been thinking about as to how do we try and mitigate some of the time and I would say lessons lost that the slippage in the educational uh, competencies with students not being given what they need? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think we are going to need very specific programs that target the lost achievement among students, particularly lost achievement among students from minority groups, particularly students from uh, um, uh, less advantaged economic backgrounds. I don't think it's going to be good enough simply to go back to just the way it was. I think we actually are going to need to catch these students up. And I think all systems, including higher educational systems, are going to need to be invested in that. That's some of the challenges that we have faced to continue to produce nursing students within you know, the constraints and rethinking our training and rethinking of um, yeah. how we do things. But I do think that there's been a lot of tremendous innovation in thinking about how do we communicate? And I think that your time today is, has really taught us that we can bring scholars such as yourself to our classrooms and to our communities with minimum travel and, it's, and it works, right? Yep. And I think that we're able to really, I think, level the playing field in terms of particularly in rural communities by having more experts spend time listening and having more access. I'm also wondering what you're thinking about um, telecommunication and our telehealth. What do you see the future of that within the spectrum of public health? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And uh, I think it's one of the things that we've learned we can do during COVID. And I, I don't want us to lose that. I think we've learned that that uh, we can deliver some medical services through um, remote means. And that that allows us to bring access to people who otherwise might not have access. And I think it's in the realm of, it's, it's in the realm of ideas that we have become familiar with and learn how to use in a time of COVID. And I, I think it would be a mistake to lose those ideas. What are your thoughts on how things will look like living with COVID generally? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I feel like um, 
anybody who tells you what uh, things are going to look like is um, is uh, going to get, going to be wrong. So I'm going to be very cautious. Um, I do think that COVID will become endemic, meaning we'll have a baseline level of COVID and we'll live with it the way we live with the flu. There will be vaccines on some sort of regular basis. And um, I think we'll move beyond it. I really do think it becomes, it will become part of the background of infectious diseases that we live with, like all other infectious diseases. I think we're going to have another major pathogen that's coming. And I think the lessons that we've learned that you have outlined so exquisitely, if we were all to mobilize about health and start to address some of these other issues, we might be far more resilient the next time the next one's coming around. Because if you read the stories of what happened, um, you know, with the first pandemic and, you know, that in 1918, and my own relatives actually um, experienced that. They were living outside of Philadelphia and the experiences of Philadelphia versus St. Louis. How do we take the collective of our country now and looking at the, your maps about how America was on fire, how do we then think about this within the global world and, and as we get new pathogens coming our way? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I don't dispute that, which is in, in no small part of why I wrote this book, because I do think there will be future pathogens. And I think we will have the exact same problem with those future pathogens, unless we actually tend to the fundamental problems that are the case now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering, are there any final thoughts or final things? Because I, I can not thank you enough because this was just brilliant, brilliant presentation. I see a lot of things in the chat saying it was, thank you so much. They loved it. It was insightful. Well, Galvanizing is another word. Well, I'm delighted. Well, thank you so much for hosting me. It's really a privilege to be here with you. And thank you for all the work you all do. Well, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.